was queen of the bongo Papa was king of the Congo Deep down in the jungle I start begging my first bongo Every monkey like to be in my place instead of me Cause I'm the king of bongo baby I'm the king of bongo bongo Sup guys This is Pete the Carrot Man How's it going? Welcome back to How to Master 6 Max Zoom And we're moving on to post flop play today um, Last time we talked about how to build, reverse build if you like, a button strategy where we began by looking at what hands we could continue to a 3-bet and then worked our way backwards to find out how wide a GTO defensible optimal um, opening range would be in the first place from the button. Today we're going to do things in more of a forwards manner where we're going to open up in a spot and then see what our range looks like on the flop and then plan how we're going to divide that range into some sub-ranges. The idea here is that, again, you know, we're playing Zoom in Zoom we want to frequently be very aware of our default strategies in a lot of common situations, both pre-flop and post-flop. We want to know what our range looks like. We want to know what the optimal way to balance that range is against our population. We want to make ourselves defensible, but at the same time um, have a balanced strategy which is very adaptable, that we can that we, we can change very quickly and easily when we learn of imperfections and exploitative um, deviations in our opponent's games. Then we'll add some exploitative deviations to our own game as a countermeasure. So that's the idea. We're going to move more towards post up today, but still stay with the theme of building a launch pad range. So that's going to be our goal. The launch pad range, if you've not, if you don't know what that means, you've probably not watched the earlier episodes of this series, so I'd go back and do that. A launch pad range is the one that we start off with in our game before we have reason to deviate for some kind of reason. It's like a balanced strategy in most spots. Um, or it could be an exploitative strategy because the population plays really badly, but it's our default in the game that we're playing, basically, for whatever spot we're in. So I'm going to start off with our example situation today, and we're going to discuss um, some of the features of that spot and get a little bit of flavour about that situation before we range build in it. Then we're going to talk about balance requirements. Balance always demands certain things of us. There are always certain rules we have to follow if we want to build a balanced range. Um, similarly, there are certain taboos that we should avoid doing because they would lead to unbalance. Um, there are many balance strategies that we can build, but we are trying to build one that makes the most sense where each hand is doing the best thing that it can do in that balance strategy. We're going to then talk about choosing containers. This is another metaphor. I guess I get bored of the word range. A uh, container is going to be a sub-range, basically. So if we get to the flop and um, we're going to see bet some hands and check fold some other hands, um, the check fold would be a container that would be full of different hands and the C bet would be a container that would be full of loads of different hands as well. So ranges and sub ranges is what I mean by containers. Um, a pre-flop range will be the overall container, then that will contain like four more containers or whatever, depending on how you're splitting your range up and each of those containers will contain subsets of ranges or of hands. Then we're going to build the launch pad range and we're going to basically solve the spot. The idea in this series is that we talk about the theory of the situation, how it relates to balance, how it relates, how our range looks. Then we go through and solve it to actually construct a strategy that we can play as our launch pad strategy in that spot. Um, my students ask me sometimes regarding launch pad ranges, like, do I need to build one of these for every single situation I'm ever going to find myself in? And of course, the answer to that is no, because it would be ridiculous to go into every single spot you could ever uh, be confronted with and actually build a range for it. If you try to learn in that kind of parrot fashion where you just build a chart one day and then not remember the next day why it was good but just follow it blindly, you're not going to learn anything and you're not, your brain is human, it's very limited and finite. You're not like a supercomputer that can store hundreds of thousands of different strategies and just bring them up without knowing what they're good, why they're good. That's what computers do. If I had to train my iMac to play poker, I would tell it to just memorize lots of different ranges and play them all in different situations. You play a computer at chess, it doesn't know why it's making a good move. It doesn't understand why a move is good. It's just programmed through algorithms to actually solve for the best move or the best line or whatever. So we're not computers. We're not going to do that. We're not going to be programming our brains in that kind of robotic fashion. Instead, we're going to be learning the human skill of actually how to build a range for a spot, how to problem solve a spot and find the best balanced or unbalanced strategy in that spot and then we're going to go off and do that on our own. So when we are confronted with a new spot, we're not starting from nothing and we're not just trying to drudge up in some parrot fashion or range that we learned three months ago. We're actually understanding the elements of the spot and problem solving it in the moment. And eventually you will, trust me on this guys, you will get to the level if you do enough work on this where you can devise a strategy at the table pretty quickly because you've already got the main themes and ideas 
of that of the situation in your head and you've built ranges using those same themes and ideas before so you know roughly what to do and also the more you play and the more you do work in your own game and watch series like this one the better idea and familiarity you'll have of your own range in the first place to then start subdividing it then we're going to do some more live play because i always want to just show you guys how i'm thinking about lots of different situations and we're going to have our opening range for the spot in question on screen we're not going to have the the range that we built for playing on the flop because it's a bit too specific to have it on screen it's not like that flop is going to pop up in your session most likely in that very situation so it's not a very useful in game learning aid it's more just something you can do to work on your skill of range building out of game so in game we're going to just look at our small blind opening range and try to learn that so let's start with i just gave away the example situation hero is in the small blind with xx those cards remind me of like makeup that's what it looks like like that horrible kind of makeup that girls have that's that colour but then they put it on their face and it's not quite that colour thankfully um, it folds around and hero opens to 3x in the big blind calls alright so fairly standard open size from the small blind you may want to go smaller than this if you have nits or very tight population that auto folds and over folds it's range folding like over 60% um, big blind to small blind steal you may want to go bigger than this if you have a horrible fish who plays really fit or fold on the flop or one who you just want lots of money in the pot against but that's a good standard size. So the flop comes king, queen, six, rainbow. Have a think about roughly what hero should do with different parts of his range in order to play a good balance strategy. By the way, guys, um, I just had a thought there that the thread for this series is just like really quiet. Are you guys liking this? Like, is there something else you want me to do instead? Um, let me know. Is this a good series? What's lacking from it? What else can I do? What else do you want to know about Zoom? What questions do you have? That like people are watching the videos. That space underneath is for you to get more out of future videos by giving me ideas so do use it like get in touch let me know it's always nice to know that when i'm making a big massive long series that it's actually going down well so yeah give me some feedback so that's our situation defined we have king queen six rainbow board we have xx xx just representing that we have a range that is not any two set cards and i always try and get my students to think in terms of ranges whenever possible instead of just exact whole cards it's not good to know what you would do with eight seven in that spot if you don't know what you would do with all the other hands that you could open think of it in terms of a range and solve the opening range not just like oh i have ace four should i open or not i don't know because i've never built a range that's not good think in terms of ranges so we talk about balance requirements now what is balance going to demand or ask of us in order for us to be staying within the limits of being unexploitable post-flop when we play a strategy? We want to be unexploitable as a bit of a recap, just so that before we know how to best exploit villain, we're not unnecessarily opening up ways in which we can be exploited or generating info for all of villain's HUDs that lets them play well against us. We don't want our default strategy to be unbalanced because then that strategy gets observed and exploited. We want a balanced default strategy and we only want to go off exploitatively on, in a direction when we have reason to think that villain is doing something not enough or too much in relation to balance. So, balance will require then that, will require that hero ensures that where he bets the flop, he has a balanced ratio of bluffs to value that makes villain indifferent to calling it wider than is balanced. So if Villain wants to add extra floats to his range or even extra folds to his range, we're not going to make those floats or folds good or bad. We're going to make them zero EV. We're going to do this by making sure that Villain realizes his required equity to call the flop roughly. We kind of have to estimate on the flop. It's not like an end of action spot. It's not like we can solve it exactly like we can on the river or when someone goes all in because there are distorting factors in the hand, like the next streets that are yet to be played out. But we can estimate how often roughly he needs to call the flop and we can look to make sure that our strategy gives him around that much equity basically um looking at how much equity he needs from his point of view i should say and then making sure we give him that much equity on the flop and we do that with both our bet size and with our actual range itself so when hero checks the flop he should be check folding check calling or check raising amounts that make villain indifferent to stabbing as a low equity bluff it's really kind of impossible to make villain indifferent to stabbing a flush draw because that hand has an absolute heap of equity against us we can't make him indifferent to stabbing that that's just going to be plus ev we have to accept that if we wanted to make him indifferent to stabbing a flush draw we would have to actually like only check the flop with amazingly strong range that we were going to continue with all the time and raise him with a good amount of the time as well so that's not our aim our aim is to make it the case that he can't just take like random two undercards and just bet the flop and auto profit against us we want him to not print money with his lower equity hands that's how we balance ourselves, that's how we protect our range. So 
we are going to check the flop probably um, with some hands in this situation. Well, we'll get to that later, but I think that we would. Um, well, I know that we would. <laughs> I'm kind of giving stuff away already. but um, So when we do check the flop, we want to make sure that we're not always check folding, as that would make it very, very good for him to stab. And we want to make sure that we're not always check calling, because that would make it very, very bad for him to stab. And you might say, what's the problem? Surely we want it to be bad for him to stab. Well, no, we don't, because if it's bad for him to stab, then it's very good for him not to stab. And we don't want to make it very good for him to do any exploitative strategy against us at all, until we know that we're exploiting him, and we know which one he's going to take. Otherwise... Our default strategy is asking to be exploited, like I just said earlier. So what should Hero do then? He should pick the best hands for each job. It's like Plato's Republic. Every every hand does the best job it can. Every person does the best the thing they're best at and they enjoy. That's what justice is, whatever. That's the analogy I like to use here. Every hand in your range fits into a specific sub-range better than other hands do or better or some hands um, fit into, be into some sub-ranges better than they fit into other sub-ranges. So we want to put each hand in the right place while at the same time building a holistic strategy that is balanced. That's our aim, basically. It's like building a car. You want the overall car to run and take you from A to B and not explode and not poison you with fumes. But you also want like each part of the car to be doing the best thing. You don't want the exhaust pipe to be sticking out of the steering wheel and then to have some kind of straw coming out the back of the car to expel its... Um, it's waste that's just not very efficient or sensible. It's the same when we're building a range. We want the right parts in the right place and we want the holistic overall thing to do what it's supposed to do, i.e. here, be balanced and be as plus AV as possible in the process. So we're going to build the containers. We're going to call each sub-range a container and then decide which containers we need in the first place. So before we decide how to play our range on this king queen six flop where we've raised blind versus blind, we want to know which containers we're going to be using before we fill them. Are we going to have a check call range? Are we going to have a check raise range? Are we going to have a betting range? Are we going to have a check folding range? For example, if we were on the button against big blind, we probably wouldn't have any range other than a betting range on the flop because we can probably just bet, um, okay, not on that texture, let's take a really dry texture like four, four, six. We want to protect all our equity on that board. A lot of our hands are vulnerable, that are ahead a lot of the time, and our range is way ahead of villains, and I think we have license to see about everything there. However, on this board, we are out of position, and the board contains, you know, some high cards that connect quite well with villain. It's going to be a bit different. It's not going to just be, like, licensed to bet everything. So do we want a betting range? Do we want a check calling range? Do we want a check folding range? And do we want a check raise range? PowerPoint is, like, I guess it's... Um, advising the colors that go well with the grinder skill template and it, template and i guess they do i love to throw like oranges and reds and yellows and bright colors into the mix but there's a very cold color scheme that jeffrey has de devised for grinder skill maybe that says something about the kind of person he is he likes all these cold and dark colors who knows maybe he's like evil or something secretly but anyway i'm kind of deviating here i'm sure jeffrey's not evil i just wanted to like go on a little rant there for no reason it's always fun right but yeah the color scheme is kind of cool i guess it does fit it's chosen well with the grander school theme i don't know if that's jeffrey's doing or whether that's grander school's doing uh, or whether that's um, powerpoint that does it automatically but anyway so containers what are they going to be like well this is a check fold range. This range might not always be necessary on the flop as the preflop raiser. Example, um, when we're in position, we can't check fold. Or if villain was like super, super foldy to the sea bets, we probably wouldn't check fold anything against the fish on like ace four four if the fish folded seventy percent to sea bets. Um, but a lot of times out of position, it is going to be necessary. So hero is out of position, and the board connects quite well with villain's big blind calling range. Remember, king queen six rainbow, which is fairly Broadway heavy. His calling range. I say it's Broadway heavy because we've opened 3x and the types of hands in a polar model that want to flat here and not 3-bet bluff and not 3-bet for value, a lot of them, not all of them by any means, but a lot of them are actually big Broadway hands like Jack-10, Queen-Jack, King-Queen, King-Jack, this kind of stuff, King-10, Queen-10. Um, and so on a board like King-Queen-X, Villain will flop open and straight draws, pairs and gut shots quite often, basically. And all these hands in position we would imagine today in 2016 are going to call a c-bet. They're not just going to fold because they're way up there in villain's range. So because of that, if we just go like crazy and bet like pocket fours or eight five suited, I don't think we have that eight, let's say we bet like ace seven off or something like that. We're just betting way too wide and we're asking to be exploited. Our default strategy in that case, if we didn't have a check fold range, would be to c-bet way too much or check called terrible showdown value. Both are pretty awful op um, options in terms of EV. So... We'd end up in a situation where our default launchpad strategy was asking Villain to make very profitable floats and flop raises and things like that against us. 
so we want to avoid that. A check call range, let's talk a little bit about that. Why might we want that? Well, usually where the above range is necessary, so too is this one. So if we're going to check folds and combos, what's the problem with just check folding everything we're going to check? Well, it's obvious, right? Villain can just bet and print money. His stabs become super high EV. We've given him a super high EV exploitative strategy to use against as well, and that's the very thing we wanted to avoid in building a balanced strategy in the first place. So we don't want to do that. So we need a check call range, um, usually to balance the check fold range. I mean, okay, we could use check raise instead, but we're going to run into a problem that what are we actually doing with our mediocre showdown value hands? Check call makes a lot of sense here, as Hero has many medium strength, stable showdown value hands. SDB is showdown value. Um, so what is his stable showdown value? It's things like on King Queen 6, it's going to be... Can I like go back to that slide really quickly? No. Um, it's stuff like... Queen X, weak kings, 6X, pocket nines. This kind of stuff is probably able to check call a certain amount of streets depending how strong it is. Some of our hands will check call one, some will check call two, some will check call all the way down if we want to be balanced. We won't like check call the flop and fold all of our check call flop range on the turn or something like that. Back in the dark ages when people didn't think about poker in, in terms of playing your own range and making villain indifferent, they used to just like flail around in the dark and say stuff like, you can only call one here with your whole range or you know, you should just like call down because if you check call flop, you have to check call down to the river. And they just didn't understand that certain hands play certain jobs and overall you can still make villain, stop villain like exploiting you just by playing your range. And now we understand that. We understand a lot more about the game and, and its essence and how to actually play the game. And we know that certain hands make a lot of sense as check calls for certain amounts of streets. And that's why check calling the flop here is good because we can do it in a very balanced way. People used to say in 2010, don't check call the flop, it's weak and it gives villain license to just blast at you. I don't care if he blasts at me, I'm going to call down enough of my range on the river to make that bad, or at least to make it indifferent until I know he's doing it. If I know he's doing it, I'll just call down everything and kill him. I mean, come on, it's not that difficult. You don't have to like flail around in the dark and make ridiculous assertions like if you call flop, you must call turn. No, you don't. You must call turn some amount that makes villain indifferent. You mustn't call turn with every combo you call flop with. That would be ridiculous and unbalanced. So just be aware of these myths and if bad players say things to you on these topics like these, just like have a radar in your head that goes off and defends pure balance in poker and just tells them they're full of shit, basically. I like to go on rants about the terrible logic that people use. A betting range here in blue. This range is also necessary here. Hero desires three streets of value with some hands in his range, wants to be able to double and triple barrel bluff, and would like to get some fold equity with his more suitable air draw hands on the flop. If I flop a gut shot here, jack nine on king queen x, I don't want to check call that hand, it's jack high and it has four outs to improve. I sure as hell don't want to um, check fold it either because it's got four outs to make the nuts. Like, come on, that's pretty good in terms of my range. I open a lot of worse hands than that on this texture. So I want to bet it. I want to pick up fold equity and be able to realize equity if I get called. It's not often I'm going to get raised on king 9x. It's like almost never um, on king, sorry, king queen 6 here. Most Compton players are not going to have much of a raising range here at all because they're just miles behind me. So in terms of like hands that raise, like they don't have that many like nutted hands. They have king, queen and sixes, but I have probably king six, maybe queen six suited, king six off maybe. I probably also have um, kings and queens and they don't, well I do have kings and queens and they don't, so. So this range is necessary, definitely we want a betting range because we just need to value bet some hands um, to get three streets and we also need to protect, not on this board so much protect, but we need to, we also need to bluff and semi bluff a lot of hands here as well. We want to triple as well, like we don't just want to like never triple the river, that would be unbalanced. We want some combos that we think are good to fire three streaks with. Um, something like Jack 10 is like fairly decent. I mean it blocks, okay it's not great because it blocks villains Jack 10, but like you could take like Jack 9 or something and gut shot and just go blast, blast, blast bombs away here against the reg and it could be part of a good balance strategy. I mean you're just, you don't have that many high EV bluffs on a rainbow board, so use the better ones you do, your straight draws and you know, double them, triple them to balance out the times you're value betting ace king for three streets. Check raise, um, I don't believe this is a spot that we want a check raise range, it's not often I actually employ check raise ranges as a pre-flop raise or out of position honestly. Um, I used to do this a lot but then I found that I didn't really have enough value combos to distribute evenly within all my different ranges for putting money into the pot. Um, if I only have a check call and a bet range I can kind of handle that, you know I can split my value combos up there in a sensible way but check raise needs to be really polarized, as does a betting range here, also needs to be quite polarized. So I just don't have enough like nutted combos to, be, to create two really polarized ranges here that are like properly balanced. I don't think it's the best way. It would be a balanced strategy to check raise 
certain amounts here. You could create a balance strategy doing that and balancing that with your check calls and check folds and bets, but it's probably not the highest EV balance strategy for that reason. Sorry, did I go too fast over that last part? So hero gets a bad price, I didn't explain it. So this range is not necessary. Hero gets a bad price on a bluff here and doesn't have enough value hands to go around three non-folding ranges. Like he only really has, like what hands are good enough to check raise for value here? Something like king, queen, like top two pairs, something like kings, queens, sixes, king, six, like two pair plus. Do I really want to put all of those in my check raise range? Then my betting range gets insanely capped and then guess what's happened? Well, villain then is able to float me again really profitably on the flop because I just don't have enough value hands to like barrel them off by the river or he can call me down late or whatever. Or I have to use less bluffs then I have to check fold the flop more and now he can stab at me. Like everything you do, you create an imbalance and you give villain, every imbalance you make in your own game, you create a way in which villain can punish you for it basically and just penalize you for that. So let's move on to hero's pre-flop range. We need to know what that is before we can even begin to design a post-flop strategy. So here we have the flop ignorantly just like placed all over the pre-flop range. I thought this was a good way to do it because I was kind of running out of space on this slide. Kind of squashed the cards a little bit too. They're like small fat cards, but I like it. So this is an opening range that's 40% exactly from the small blind. This is pretty damn close to the opening range I would use blind versus blind in my games, 50 and L6 max zoom or 100s as well. Um, it's probably a range you can defend quite optimally to 3-betting as long as you 4-bet enough, 4-bet call enough for value and 4-bet bluff enough of the blocker hands in this range. Um, and then you can look to flat a bunch of this to a 3-bet out of position here as well, like your bigger suited cards, your broadways, your better suited connectors, your better pairs that are hybrid hands between implied odds and just frequent strength and that kind of stuff. So I'd recommend you use this range in the micros as well. At micro zoom, like 10L zoom, you can probably steal like 55% in this spot and people won't do enough about it, but do like tighten up against the guys who are known to be active three bettors basically. So this range is fine. Here's what hero gets the flop with. If So have a look on your own now, like see if you can break this up into three containers, the ones we chose on the previous slide, which were to recap, check fold, check call and bet. These are the containers we chose. So we want to fill those up with the best hands for the best jobs. So every single hand you see here it goes into the post-flop range. Where is it going to go? Which box is it going to go into? Try and do this in a way that actually balances um, these ranges out. So if you're betting, make sure you're not just betting like loads and loads of value hands and no bluffs or vice versa. If you're betting a range here, you kind of need to make villain indifferent. Now, you probably, his required equity for calling the flop here if you bet like two thirds pot would be 28%, but it's actually going to be more than that because hero's range is gonna have a lot of equity against villain. He's not gonna be able to just realize equity that, that purely. So he's probably gonna need somewhere like 40%. So that means that your, your range in the flop here can be, you can be close to 50-50 value to bluff combos, basically probably something like, I don't know, like six plus or four value or something. I don't know, I think in practice you can probably go a bit bigger than that as well. Um, and you can bluff more, more evenly. And your bluffs do have a lot of equity here. Some of them, like your straight draws and your your gut shots and stuff, they have equity. So you can go like 50-50 or even slightly more bluff heavy and still be balanced in this spot on the flop due to having two streets still to get fold equity as well as pot equity later on in the hand. So pause the video now. Go ahead, get Poker Ranger out if you have it or get pen and paper and just work out which hands pen and paper is. So like antique, like maybe get like Microsoft Word or something if you want to just stay on your computer, who knows. Um, and build these sub ranges, these containers, fill them up, what hands, think about what hands are good to check fold, what hands are good to check call, what hands are good to bet, make sure that when you're checking, you're check calling a reasonable amount. If villain's going to stab at you two thirds pot here, he needs 33% to just break even, just take money down with any two cards here to, to show a profit. Any, if you fold any more than sort of 33% of your range there, he's going to be able to do that pretty easily. So try and get close to that target. It doesn't have to be exact, but don't be folding like 60% when, or even 50% when villain bets here. Try and create a fold, check fold to check all ratio that's sensible with making villain indifferent to bluffing you with a predicted standard sizing of like two thirds the pot bet on his part. So pause now and go for that. Okay, I'll assume that you've now paused, had a go at that and unpaused the video. 
So here's a brief description of the way I would play this spot before we actually get into the nitty gritty of exactly which hands fall into each container. So first off in the check fold range, we're going to start with our lowest equity hands, and these are the ones that have poor improvement potential. So if we look at this grid here, we're going to be talking about hands like the small pocket pairs that just have two outs to call uh, to improve when they get called and are behind. Like quite often, these hands will be totally in bad shape when they get called for two reasons. One, they have very poor equity to improve when they actually do get called, like they they have two outs. And what was the other reason? So when you bet fours here, secondly, like even if you do have the best hand, like villains called you with like two overcards or something, you're still going to lose the pot because it's not really a hand you can make it the showdown with. You're not really going to bet fours and then check call turn and river unless you ever read that villain is like very, very flow heavy and stab happy on the turn and river. So you get the idea here. These hands are just really bad and they're going to go into the check fold bucket. Um, other hands that would go in there would be just really poor offsuit combos that don't have any backdoor draws and things like that. We don't want to see bet like really bad equity hands. Um, so a lot of our offsuit junk and even our club suited hands that don't have any backdoor draws could go in there as well. I mean, depending on your range, you may even put some other backdoor flush draws in there, but I think we can probably get away without doing that. Like, and I know that we do because I've already done this exercise myself. Um, check calling. These hands are going to have showdown value. Some of it we're going to call once, some of it twice, and some of it three times. So hands that we would call once and give up might be like pocket eights, pocket sevens, pocket nines, um, six x. Hands that we'd call twice might be like queen x. Um, like weaker queen x and hands that we might call three times might be like better queen x like king queen or sorry like ace queen or like king x that was just a bit too weak to bet the flop and just went for a check call to strengthen our check call range so the bottom line is that our check call hands here will always have shown in value of some sort we're not going to check call like i don't know um nine seven of clubs on this flop it just wouldn't make any sense and we're going to bet a polarized range we know that because we're check calling our mediocre hands here it follows from that that the range we're actually going to bet is going to be very polarized. It's going to be our better top pairs plus for value and then our bluffs that have more suitability, like that have some backdoor draws or have some gut shots or straight draws or something like that. So that's the rough model that we're going to use. Um, so now we can go ahead and actually flesh it out. This is a little bit messy. I tried to make the colors consistent with the containers. Like you can see the, co the container colors here of black, light blue and dark blue. So I tried to do that as well with the colors here. I don't know if it really, I really pulled it off though because it just looks ugly as hell to me. But anyway, um, ignore this number here where it says 15 in the box. That's Poker Ranger. What Poker Ranger does is you can build colors here on the left by going here and you can tell it like what colors you want to make each sub range. And it's just numbering the sub ranges from one to 16. It means nothing. It's nothing to do with combos. It's nothing to do with the actual way hero plays this range here or the strategy of this spot. So ignore that 15, pretend it's not there. So see that value. Here's a number that does matter. This is the amount of combinations in the CBET value range, which is the blue and white, not the blue and yellow. These look quite similar, but they are in fact different. If you're colorblind, I highly apologize for my terrible use of color here. It's not going to be helping you at all. Um, probably should have thought about that, but basically, for anyone who is colorblind, these are the types of hands we're going to be um, CBETing for value. Our better top pair, so it's like King 8 suited plus and King 8 offsuit plus, and our sets and two pair plus combos. So our kings with a better kicker, like our kings that can sometimes get called by worse kings, basically. Even if it's rare, like king eight, he can have smaller suited kings in his range pre. It's possible he flats his blind versus blind with king seven or king six suited, for sure. So 114 combos here, and we're going to balance that with a C bet range that is as a bluff. Now bluff here doesn't mean like total bluff necessarily. Some of these bluffs have very low equity. The three here, actually shows how many combos of each hand there are. So these ones are four because I don't care what suit they are. I'm gonna bluff all the Jack-9 suited, they're all gut shots to me, I'm all, I'm happy with them. I'm gonna bluff all the Jack-10 suited, they're all gut shots to me, I'm gonna bluff all the Jack-10 off, they're all open end straight draws to me, that's fine. Sorry, these are open end straight draws as well, Jack-10. Board is King-Queen-6. Um, and so these hands, I don't care what suit they are. However, when it, when it comes to the hands that just have backdoor draws, like eight, seven suited, I want them to have a backdoor flush draw as well. Um, a lot of these hands have like backdoor flush draws, backdoor straight draws. Some just have backdoor flush draws and overcard like a six, and these are going to be only bet when they don't have when they're not clubs basically. So when they have ways of turning flush draws on the turn, that's going to make our turn range more robust, and it's going to give us it's going to give us the opportunity to barrel more turns as a bluff. We don't want to give up on the turn with an overwhelmingly large majority of our flop c bet range. That would be to play in an unbalanced way for no reason. So we want to avoid that. I want to go ahead and bet the turn 
um, as a bluff sometimes as well, or as a semi-bluff, and having the flush draws gives us more equity to do that on certain runouts. So that's going to be our bluffing range. You can see that our we're not going to see bet just hopelessly dead hands here like Queen 8 offsuit. The reason for that is that, sorry, not Queen 8, that's got a pair. Um, like Ace, sorry, the black range, Ace 8 offsuit, Ace 7 offsuit. These hands are, they don't have the showdown value required to check call. They don't have really that much equity when you bet and get called with them. They're just pretty poor hands to turn into a bluff here. And the Ace X can win at showdown if Villain's going to pass if Buddha wants to check down Jack High. If he's bad enough to do that, some people are. Also, same with our under pairs, they're really bad. So our check fold range here is basically the hands that we just don't feel that we can profitably, we can maybe in a vacuum get away with profitably c-betting them, maybe not. It depends on villains fold to c-bet here. We don't know if they're profitable to c-bet or not. So what we're going to do is play our range in a balanced way and c-betting would certainly inflate our c-bet bluff percentage to the point that we were c-betting like a good bit more bluffs than value and that would be exploitable to getting floated. So we don't want that. Let's stick to nine and 90 and to a total of our betting range is going to be, well, it's not even really worth calculating this because it's not exact, like a lot of our bluffs have equity, but 90 to 114 is going to be 90 divided by 204. If you want to figure out what percentage of your range is going to be a bluff here, and it's only 44%. So I said before, like if we can, we have a roughly one-to-one -one ratio here that's relatively balanced on the flop due to the equity we can realize in the fold equity we can realize on later streets. So we're doing pretty well here with a 90 to 114, um, 45 to 55 ratio here, I think. This range is 192 combos, it's check call. It's the hands that we could see that some of these on the flop for one street of value, but why do that when we can get that value later anyway? And we can actually utilize these hands to protect our flop check folding range. This black range here does need some protection. It can't be a huge part of our checking range because otherwise, like I said before, a villain would just be able to bluff um, very happily at us when we check. He can just stab and indeed one of the biggest leaks that the micro stakes player will have in these spots. And you'll notice it in the population you play against at like 10 no limit or whatever is that the micro grinder will basically just check fold way too much. Like when he checks his flop, he will have way more black than light blue because he's just c-betting too much top pair and even queen x sometimes or whatever. And he's like not check calling enough basically. And he's giving up too much. So that's really bad. Don't do that. It's not going to be cool. So balancing that with our check folds, we're check folding 120 out of 120 plus 192. So we're check folding 120 divided by 312 percent of the time which is 38 percent so if villain's going to bet two-thirds pot here he'll need 40 but did i say 33 percent earlier my god i'm such a fish sorry if villain faces a two-thirds pot bet he'd need 28 percent to call um if he makes a two-third pot bet as a pure bluff he needs 40 percent fold equity not 33 you don't know what the hell i was talking about i think i did say that earlier that's really bad i think i've been coaching too much today and it's like fried my brain who knows um so yeah he needs us to fold 40% to break even, like, with a total bluff. We fold 38%. That's pretty good, you know. We're making it slightly bad for him to bluff, like, any two cards and give up the turn, which is good. That's what we want to do. We're very nicely balanced here with our check, full check, call range. I'm going to say this. I'm very proud of the strategy that I built today when I was making this video. I think this is about perfect. Um, I don't really see many ways that the strategy can be improved. It's very balanced. It's very plus EV because each hand is doing the best job it can do, and it's just not exploitable in any way, I don't think. I think villain's going to suffer to do much about this. I think it's a great strategy. Um, you need to break the check call portion up on the turn and river. For example, obviously hands like nines and tens we're only going to call once with. I favor those over eights and sevens because eights and sevens are never going to like win a showdown against nines and tens, basically. Whereas tens and nines can win against these hands. And villain, you get a breed of villain who just bets the flop with any hand just for the hell of it when you check that does happen. So it's better to have these and these. There's not much difference, but they are better. 6x is good because it has shown a value and it has 5 outs to improve when behind. It's a nice check call. Um, King X is obviously good because it's just very invulnerable. It just beats a lot of stuff and we can call down 3 streets with it because it blocks villain's value range considerably. Queen X doesn't block vil villain's value range as much, though it does block it more than 6x because we have hands like Queen Jack and Queen 10 that block King Jack and King 10, whereas 7 6 doesn't really block King 7 the same way. It's not as important. Um, and so. Yeah, this is fine. And one strange thing about this range may be that King's top set is actually a check. And I think that's just that the hand just crushes the deck. We get less value 
when we bet this hand, and so it makes sense to put this into our check call range and give us even extra firepower to check call down three streets, or rather, check call, check call, check, shove the river. So Villain has 38% fold equity with a stab here, that's about what we want, and our C bet range is pretty balanced. So I think this is awesome, I think this is the way you should play this spot, I don't see a better strategy for us. I think that you can go through a bunch of other spots and solve them in a similar way. It's not easy at first, building this took a bit of playing around with the ranges and getting all the, the combos right, it's a bit of an art as well as a science. Um, but it's a very worthwhile skill to work on because you know, like I say, you don't want to be a parrot that just has a big collage of ranges to learn without knowing why you want to be able to build your own strategies as you move up the stakes. And anyone playing like fifth in the limit zoom needs to be able to do this. They need to know how they're playing the flop in this spot. So we're going to go to the flop and in our live play now. And when this flop is a bit different or we have position, we'll talk about why the situation is different through our launchpad strategy. And we'll try and work on the skill of actually differentiating the different elements of post-flop spots and what makes you want to adapt your strategies in different ways for those spots. So that's us done for today with the PowerPoint. Hope you enjoyed that. Let's jump into some live play now for the remainder of the session. I'll just bring my recorder timer up as usual so I know how I'm doing time-wise. So we'll play for about 10-15 minutes today as usual. King 8 here, we can defend that blind versus blind against the men open. It's going to be fine. It's this kind of spot where pot odds just make calling better than folding. This is a, a board where I can have a bunch of straights here actually, so I probably would have a raising range on this texture. Um, but I wouldn't raise King 8, I would just be calling it. And I, um, I would lead a blank turn for value here, but because the turn is four to a straight, I'm going to just check call my hand instead and then work out where it is on the river. I don't expect that jack to have hit him at all. Like I expect it to actually make his river range more bluff heavy because for one, he'll check jack x back here almost certainly. And for two, he doesn't have flush draws too much when he checks flop. And so if he bets this river, I think he's polarized enough and I block eight, seven. Um, so I'm going to just call. I think my hand's fairly suitable blocker wise and we win because we are awesome, obviously. Well, we don't win because we're awesome. We won because of um, variance giving him a bluffing range. But I just think that like people are so unaware of balance that his range is almost certainly just like very weighted towards bluffs in that spot. I could be very surprised if he was like he's got king queen of spades there. I'd be very surprised if he had enough value combos. Like I bet he bets most of his seven x on a flop. I bet he's repping almost nothing there. I bet we can just overcall our range substantially. So even though our hand blocking eight seven, like blocking one of the nutted combos, was a very suitable part of our range to actually call with, it's still um, the case that I would call weaker or less suitable hands there because I just feel like my block, like his range is just so likely to be unbalanced towards air. I'm going to just range bet this flop here. There's not that much you can do on jack 5, 3, 2 tone. It's relatively dry. Our range is way ahead of his. Um, I squeezed aces here and I get a really nice flop. Um, our hand is like somewhat vulnerable here. If we weren't three way and there wasn't a flush draw, I could, I would definitely just like check this part of my range along with a lot of my more mediocre showdown value. But given the fact that it's a bit wetter and we're three way, I don't really want to give free cards. So I'm going to just bet 12 on the flop and shove the turn. I've created a stack to pot ratio when we go three way here that I kind of need to bet like pretty big to get the money in over two streets. And obviously we just snap off against the fish's king jack and I'm pretty happy about it. Um, ace jack here, I can call. It's going to be in my flatting range with a fish behind me. I don't need to turn that into a bluff or anything like that. If the uh, if the open came from under the gun, I might turn into a three bit bluff instead in a polar range. And facing a C bet here without any back doors, we're fairly close to the bottom of our range. There's no real incentive to defend that part of our range there. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with the format of this series, but do let me know if you think it can do with improvement in any way. Uh, king Queen here, we can flat suited against under the gun. Ace King is a clear three bet. Normally I'd go four, but I'm gonna go four fifty because we're a little bit deeper. It just gives villain, um, it gives us a better price in our three bet jam basically, and gives him a worse stack to pot ratio for four betting in a plus EV way. King Queen here is too good to fold with the two over cards and the back door club draw. So this is going to be a float on 7-3-2. Villain will miss this flop a lot as well. People have a tendency to one and done low cards here on the turn. And so I think it's going to be a clear call and fold turn. We'll call turn with all our better ace x. That's good showdown value here. Flush draws and our pairs. And I think this is going to be a bet. I'm not going to bet huge. I don't think. Let me just um, 
I'm going to go for a check call on the flop with enough flush draw there and showdown value. I think that's fine. We want some flush draws in our checking range and on table one, so we'll check call here. And here, I think that we do want to bet most of our pairs for protection. I'm not going to bet too big. A lot of our pairs here, like nines, don't want to make a big bet. They just want to make a small protection bet. So King Queen doesn't really want to make a big bet either. It's just trying to pick up the pot there. So a small bet should be fine. No incentive to turn our hand into a bluff on the river on table one because he's likely going to call us with all better hands that stab flop for value and then pot control turn when we get to that river. With ace queen there, he's we're basically beating anything that he stabbed flop and then gave up. So we should just continue to check the river if we check called flop. I mean, I don't know. I just don't think I would have like a a bluffing range there. Really, my range is just very showdown valuey and capped on that texture anyway. When I check call and then nothing gets there, so I think it's. Well, I don't know. I mean, I could maybe turn something into a bluff if I ever got there without showdown value. I'm just not sure that I do. Um. Kings will just go ahead and make a normal size 3 bet and we'll go ahead and open. We'll call Jack 9 there to the blind versus blind open, clear check back on the flop, showdown value. Um, Kings, I'm assuming this guy's a fish, he's a gold star, he may not be, it's not clear. I'm going to start by check calling 1 and just check folding after that. I can check call some stronger hands as well. Turn is also a check call but not such a happy one and River is, that's a call on table 1 on the turn. River's probably close between a thin value bet and a check call. I feel like there's not enough air in villain's range, so I'm just going to make a very small exploitative thin value bet. I wouldn't do this with better hands in my range. He min raises. Honestly, I think we're good here almost never um, against this line. We are getting really good pot odds for him to call 3 into like 21. We need to be good very rarely. We do block king 10, but man, I don't really see what we beat. That's close. I'm going to make a fold. I just don't think that sizing is a bluff like ever, although we only need like not much equity at all to call, we just have hardly any I think. It's kind of disciplined spot to fold in. Okay, this spot, uh, call flop, checks through, turn, river, I'm going to fold in the queen river, I think I've got a lot of better hands there, I'm not sure what villain's doing, um, or if he's unbalanced there or not, so we'll just play our range in a balanced way and look to call a lot of our better hands that have queens in them and stuff that improved basically, like jack x with a poor kicker is probably low down enough in our range for calling, checking back flop calling turn that we can fold down that river I think, just about. So I'm just playing my range because I don't really know what Villain's up to. I'll 3x here. If um, Villain had... Okay, that's maybe a mistake actually with that stack that can shove on me with that stack size. This sucks when we get min 3 bet here. I have to call, I think, because the price is so great and I'm suited. Um, and f Obviously because we're going to flop trip fives as well. That's one of the good reasons to call. Having that psychic premonition, knowing when you're going to flop trip fives is always useful. Flop's a very easy call, there's absolutely no reason to try to blow a villain off a range here. Stack to pot ratio allows us to get money in very, very easily, and we have position, which also ensures that we can do that. So both these streets are calls, rivers are call on any card, even that one, because villain's range is more weighted towards... Like, this is the thing, like, if he has aces or kings or queens here or jacks here, which he will a lot of the time, he shouldn't check call. I bet he's going to check call this river with, like, jacks or something. He should bet himself, because he's just putting money in against a weaker range. Okay, check folds, I don't know what that would be, just some over cards or whatever. So that's fine. Um, Ace Jack here, too good to turn into a showdown value check, although I will check some hands for showdown value on table three. It's going to be a bet, basically 3x in table one because of the fish in the big blind. I'm running really good, like recently when I've been making videos, so I've just been on like a big heater, it seems. I don't run this good when I'm not making videos, guys, it's not like all the time. Or anything, just like aces here, kings there. It's a hard life. Go ahead and squeeze our kings and open our aces. Hopefully we get three bet on table two. And we get flatted here. Just gonna do a quick look and see who this guy is. Do I know him? One table, probably a fish. Excellent. Good news for me. Okay, I could bet this river over two or over three. If I bet eight here, there's gonna be 16, 38, and I'm gonna have about 37 left. That seems kind of reasonable to just do this on over two streets as the board is kind of wet and I've built a big pot here so I'm going to go ahead and bet nine and shove turn. Um, with aces our hand is too good to check so I'm going to bet and that's like the worst turn ever it puts us in a really kind of gross situation. You've got a couple of options, check fold is one, another one is just shove and try and get caught by under pairs. I like check fold and then maybe go for value in the river but maybe not. Um, it kind of sucks, like some of his flop calling range though is definitely asex, there are some sets in there. We do beat like under pairs that he's turning into bluffs, but that's about it, or some kind of lesser flush draw. 
Um, it's kind of close, but I think it's probably a fold. On any other turn, though, like pretty much it's going to be a ship that's like the one turn that improves, both improves his range and also makes him call down much tighter and kills our value, so shoving that turn is probably not so great. Going to go ahead and just stab 50 cents here with the two of spades draw. It's a terrible draw, obviously, but villain's also likely bad and just playing for a fold, obviously calling here for implied odds with the pocket threes. And just going to give up on this flop because it's terrible. And then we get queens again, so lots of big pairs today. Yeah, never call here. Pretty good board. I'm just going to start off by betting against the fish. I may pot control like aces with the ace of spades against a reg here or something. Not queens, it's a bit more vulnerable. And we're against the fish, so it's just going to be a clear bet. I'm going to bet the turn as well. If he'd called. We'll play for about five minutes, I guess, and then we'll wrap up for today. Next week, I'll probably start looking at balancing on in more advanced, like, on the later streets post-flop. So looking at some turn spots for barreling and splitting our range up there, probably. But if you guys have requests, you know, this series is not a set syllabus. I've not designed every episode or anything, or even any of the future episodes. So why don't you let me know if it's something you really want to see. And if it's suitable, I'll definitely include it. The community has been very quiet recently, like disturbingly quiet. So not much going on here. King 7 is an open normally, but this guy's 3 bet, 1 out of 1 so far, so I'm just going to tighten my opening range up a little bit there and fold that hand. Man, imagine not being able to fast fold, like how, I don't even remember how I used to make videos at non-zoom and have to talk like while well, nothing's going on, that's just crazy. I think for anyone that's wondering about volume, playing four tables of zoom, you're averaging about 1200 hands an hour, but it depends on how fast your button pushes are um, and how quickly you're fast folding. Like there's actually a skill in zoom. It sounds weird, but you can actually improve your early by fast folding really quickly like this. Like if I do that, I'm playing way more hands an hour than if I go, <laughs> ace king is a raise, I'm going to raise it. This is costing me money right now if I do that, it actually is. It sounds silly, but it completely is costing you money. Like just fast folding quicker gets more hands per hour, which gets more dollars per hour if you're a winner. If you're a losing player, it might be more sensible to play at a slower pace while you're learning the ropes. Um, Ace King three way here. It's not a million miles away from being a bet, but like if I'm gonna have a checking range, then what better hand than this? It has showdown value. It can improve to hands in the turn. I can happily bet twice. Um, yeah, I feel a bit dirty about just check folding Ace King here to one bet from a reg. In fact, I'm not going to for that price ever because my overcards are just too live and too dominating. So I'm going to call and then check fold the turn. Like I should have some check fold range there. Like the reg is going to this board is dry enough that he can just like print money by stabbing any two cards if I don't. So I do want to check all some stuff. I can check all the like, pocket nines as well and big over pairs for a couple of for like one street there. To balance my range and then just bet my more vulnerable ones, that would be fine. You can even check all stuff like 8 9 there and stuff like that as well, although that's a bit more vulnerable. Um, 10 deuce here, this price is just so great with two fish, I can't really say no with a suited hand. It's a trashy suited hand. It's the old Dial Brunson, right? 10 deuce suited. So we'll just limp along and play fit or fold in a lovely, fishy, profitable way. Um, this is under the gun, not going to be on open with guys like this to act in the cutoff who 3-bet quite a lot. It's just exactly the kind of hand that you want to cut out of your under the gun range first if you do indeed open it in the first place. Because it can't stand a 3-bet, it can't really do anything on the flop at all. Another range bet on table 1 with my whole range here. It's just going to be hard for Villain to do anything on 9-3-3. He should just naturally be overfolding his range on that flop. And the same goes on this board. I'm just going to bet like half pot with my whole range against the fish here. Never say this is an unknown. Yeah, you have five hands on him, but he's 40 20 and he's not full set. He's a fish. And he's got a picture of a cat. In fact, a lot of regs have pictures of cats too, so maybe that doesn't mean quite as much as I thought. Um, I don't often like start doubling and tripling here. I'm gonna actually triple this spot because I think he's gonna get to the river with a lot of A6. Ordinarily, I don't think he's ever gonna fold it. Oh wow. He calls that turn so quickly. Like he can't have that big a hand surely when he calls the turn that quick. Um just flat queens for now and I right, check call this flop. Oh wow, Jin. Okay, we're gonna bet this river for value. It's a little bit thin, but I think it's okay. He calls turn so fast, I just doubt he has that strong a range. He probably has just like a lot of sixes, sevens, eights, that kind of thing. I expect to see there. Um 
Okay, checks flops, we'll bet guy pots the turn. Oh man, this is close. I think I'm just gonna ship it. It's a really passive fish. I doubt he has that much air here. I'm just gonna get my money in now and stop and checking back bad rivers. I think this is best just to fast play my hand. There's not that much left, otherwise I wouldn't be shoving it, just be making a standard race size. But you don't want to really induce bluffs against the 38.58. That's not where your value is gonna come from. Your value is gonna come from just stacking in with the worst value hand. So you don't really want to bluff that. Um, you don't really want to check haul there and let him check back like he's king on a diamond river or something, or even on a normal river. Like passive fish are notoriously terrible at getting value. They'll just check back just through fear of losing the pot when they have a clear value bet. So don't let them do it. A flat 10-9 here because I don't see any evidence for aggressive squeezes or anything like that in the blinds. And he checks his flop. I have to check back with the middling showdown value part of my range, otherwise I'm just overstabbing the flop and he's not going to fold anything better or call with much worse. So it's definitely a spot to check back. And on the turn, it's close, honestly, but I think it's another check and just bet my worst ace -X. That Jack River kind of sucks. It does give him some better showdown value. I don't think I'm low enough down in my range to bluff river, though. I can bluff my like crappy pocket pairs on this river and just check my 10x. He will have got there some, some amount on that Jack River, though. If he bets, I'll probably... I don't think he bets a Jack in this river, does he? Maybe people bet a Jack here for value. I don't think most do. He could have ace -X, though, for sure. Um... I think it's probably a call because I get here with enough like crappy pairs that I would call the river there. He has a six. He doesn't go for the river value bet, which I think is a mistake. I mean, when I've not bet by the river, I think he should be value betting a six on that river, having checked twice. I don't mind this flop return play at all, but I think he's missing value by not betting with that part of his range. Um, this kind of sucks. If this guy wasn't short, um, I would want to squeeze here or flat. But oh, there's my student. How's it going? That's Rory, the guy I had on the series before. I think we actually stacked him last time. He was on. He appeared on a grand school video, so we'll just do him a favor and get out of that pot, so he doesn't, so he can keep his money. Right, guys, I'm gonna click set out next big blind and wrap up for today. Um, this is just gonna be a four bet, I think, to the small size. It's I'm flatting quite a lot of suited aces here and stuff, which is gonna push the suited kings into my four bet. Bluff range, 375, 758, 59. It's kind of large-ish, actually. I could go a bit smaller and snap folds. So I don't know if that means much. Um, Jax is going to be a call here, although not the happiest one in the world. It's quite largely a set mining call against a non... Was he a non-full stack? Maybe it is a reg. Two tabling, probably some reg, like getting his feet wet at zoom or something like that. He's not like a normal high-volume player. Uh, I'm going to call one on this flop, there's a lot of ace king and stuff like that in his range. I have some queen x here too though, so I'll probably just call one, given that we're under the gun against small blind here. I don't think it's worthy of calling any more than one street. We'll just play our last hands. He's on like every table, how can he be on every one of my tables at the same time? It's like he's found a way to 12 table zoom and get around the stars software. It's been open here with two regs and checking back this part for range. See what I mean? Like, I know these spots so well, I don't have to think about this flop. It's not like I'm going to be like, hmm, should I bet here or not? No, of course not. So just to check back because I have, like, very stable showdown value. It's not going to ever get more than, like, one or two streets of value. Um, on the turn, I'm just going to start betting. I'll also I'll have a pretty fairly polarized range here of ace -X plus, good ace -X, well, decent ace -X plus, and then, well, probably all ace -X actually, and then bluffs. Alright guys, this has been Characters, this has been episode 11 or 12 or something of How to Master 6 Max Zoom. Um, there's a chance I didn't update the right episode number, actually I've just come to think about that. Oh well. So see you guys on the next one, that will be 12 or 13 or something, and leave me some feedback please, I'd love to hear how you guys are liking the series. Run good at the tables and see you next time.